Greetings, brethren. We praise the Lord for his wonderful message as we continue to study the book of Isaiah. There is um, a, an aspect we need to study uh, as we close Isaiah chapter 1. And uh, I believe that in the upcoming presentations, we're going to be moving a little bit faster. So there are two things I need to read in. The first one, I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 1 from verses 21 all the way to verse 31. And then I'm going to come and focus on verses 16 and verse 17. So without much ado, let us go back to Isaiah chapter, chapter 1, verse 21. It says, How is the faithful city become unhallowed? It was full of judgment. Righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Obviously, we can see that here the prophet is reminiscing of how uh, Israel um, fell from being a city that was known for righteousness and true judgment. That was an example to being a city that is now, uh, you know, filled with violence and where there is just adultery and uh, mostly spiritual adultery because they were worshipping idols. That is why the Bible uses in Halot. Israel was not trusting God but was entering into all this relationship with many countries, which you actually observe during the days of uh, Ahaz, who actually goes and enters into a pact with the king of Assyria. At some point, we also see Hezekiah entering into a pact with the king of Egypt, which things God is specifically commanded in the book of Deuteronomy that should never be done. So we see that they are distrusting God and they are entering into all these relationships. And then Isaiah is asking, how is the faithful city become this? Uh, then it says, no, but now it made us in verse 22, thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water. Um, in other words, as, as the more they depart from God, even uh, whatever they have is just becoming, you know, degraded. Um, I think impure silver is useless silver. Wine mixed with water is, is just useless. Uh, it says that uh, thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither do the cause of the widow come to them. So here you see social injustice and a perversion of justice among those who held the reins of power, who were supposed to be administering justice. Uh, corruption has just been prevailing, um, and, 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 and those who were weaker, they faced a lot of oppression. And then in verse 24, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Therefore says the Lord, The Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine, of mine enemies. Uh, so obviously God, uh, as the time Isaiah is prophesying, God is going to use judgment upon Israel. And truly we see in the days of Ahaz, that God allowed nations to literally attack Israel and destroyed Judah from left, right, and center. Um, and um, yeah, many people were killed and a lot of wealth, the territory itself was cut down in size. But all these things, God was chastising the nation to bring the nation to repentance. And then notice the end that God wanted to accomplish through these things in verse 25, I will turn my hand upon you and purely page away thy dross and take away all thy tin. Um, obviously, God is um, God is using um, the, 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 how, how, how um, he is using how metals are purified to actually explain the work that he was going to do through afflictions to purify Israel. So he was going to allow nations to attack them, and yeah, and through those uh, af times of affliction, God was going to purify the nation. It's actually interesting that when you study in most of the prophets in the visions, particularly for example, when you look at uh, Daniel chapter ten, when you look at um, Ezekiel chapter one, the vision given of Christ, the Bible always says that his feet look in color like unto burnished brass. And brass is a brass is an alloy of copper and tin. Yeah, it's an alloy of copper and tin. So obviously, pure brass, pure brass is where pure, like when the metal becomes pure or it's polished brass. 
Uh, so God here uses the fact that, you know, he's going to take away all dross from the people and he's going to take away tin and they're going to be uh, purified. So he uses that concept of using purifying fire, but the purifying fire here is the afflictions that will come upon the nation. And it says, I will restore thy judges as at the first and thy counselors as at the beginning afterward. Thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Uh, so God says, I will purify and I'm going to restore. Obviously, these judges are people who walk righteously after the law of God, as was the very first king, King David, who was a king who executed true justice and judgment uh, for the welfare of every. So God is saying that I'm going to do this work. And it's amazing that God here is using the first person. I am Meaning that all this purification and the restoration is going to be through divine power. And it's important to see the work of God, God himself working. And he says in verse 27, Zion shall be redeemed uh, with judgment and yet confess with righteousness. Uh, he confess with righteousness and the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together. And they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed, for they shall be ashamed of the ox. Obviously, the ox were the trees where they were offering incense unto other idols. So God says, shall be ashamed of the ox uh, whose leaf, uh, it says, which, which you have desired, shall be confounded for the goddess that you have chosen. Uh, where they were, you know, creating shrines and offering sacrifices to all these idols. For it shall be as an ark whose leaf fadeth, and as a garden that hath no water, and the strong shall be as tall, and the maker of it as a spark. And they shall both bend together, and none shall quench it. So here it's very clear that Israel had fallen into degradation, as seed that was supposed to be full of faithfulness, righteousness, and judgment has degraded into a city of violence, social injustice, and corruption. And God says, I am going to restore things to their former state, where all is righteousness and judgment and justice in the land. And he says that he's going to deal, you know, and, and effectively deal with the work uh, of uh, the idol. So the extent that this work also of divine grace can be seen in this section to be a work that is not only outward, but that is going to reach to the heart. Because the Bible says, you shall be ashamed for they shall be ashamed of the ox which you have desired meaning that in the way that god is going to do he will permanently address the problem of idol worship from the heart so that when the people of israel will look at idols they're going to be ashamed of them because they will see that there is virtually no deliverance in an idol except only in god himself and God talks about the converts that is going to be through a work of righteousness. We, we notice here clearly that the entire work God is going to do was going to be a work of divine grace. And what is the hope we derive from this? You know, sometimes we can look at our own lives and we see the exit which we might have it fallen. And sometimes we might attempt to want to do anything that we attempt to do by our own strength, whether it's, you know, trying to change one's life, whether it's trying to do this, it's never permanent unless we submit ourselves to the outworking of divine power, which only, you know, uh, works righteousness in us. And um, this is what is being made very clear, that a city that whose sins had come to a point where God would call it Sodom, yeah, that was living in open sin and, you know, God says through divine power, I am going to restore the city and the conference are going to be, uh, you know, he had conference uh, with righteousness. So we can actually see that from the very onset of the book, God promises divine power to work uh, and to make possible that which can never be accomplished with human power. Now we then ask, OK, so if divine power is going to work, what then is the role of the human being? I want to go back to Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16, um, and I'm going to just read these three texts. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16, verse 17, and verse 18. Uh, it says, Wash you and make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. And then the next text says, Learn to do well. 
learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. They shall be as wool. Um, and says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Many people have obviously said, uh, it looks like yes, salvation by works. Wash you and make you clean. Some have even gone to the extent of preaching that Isaiah was preaching works, works, works until God revealed himself to him in Isaiah chapter uh, chapter chapter 6. And then he realized that he also, his righteousness was a filthy rags. Isaiah was not in any point preaching works. As we have just observed in the entire chapter so far, how God through his divine power was going to do this week. Actually, Isaiah chapter 6 is presented not to say that the time the events presented in chapter 1 are happening during the days of King Ahaz. And King Ahaz, he comes after King Uzziah. Uh, so you'd observe that Isaiah is looking back. Uh, he's reporting the commission that God had given him and how he began to do the work and how his work obviously took a greater scope when Ahaz came uh, and, you know, if we just overspread uh, the entirety of Jerusalem. Um, Notice in this text, when one is re reading Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16, one also understand that Isaiah is reading at a time when people like King David had lived. So when Isaiah is saying, wash you and make you clean, he knows that people cannot wash themselves. We cannot wash ourselves from sin. I wanted to observe how this idea has been used uh, in the rest of the scriptures. Notice here in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 31. Obviously, Ezekiel is a letter prophet from Isaiah. He says, Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? So here God says, Cast away from you all your transgression, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. So notice here, in casting away, in casting away, uh, and in turning from, in casting away transgressions, and in turning away from the things whereby we have transgressed, the Bible says, we make ourselves a new heart and a new spirit. I wanted to notice this text here in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, I wanted to observe what God says in verses um in verses five uh in verses um actually let me just read um in verses um i'm gonna read verses one and verse two and jump to verse six it says in verses one and it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon you the blessing and the case which i have said before thee and thou shalt call them to mind among the nations whither the lord thy god uh hath driven thee and shall return unto the Lord thy God. How shall they return? And shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy mind. Very impressive that the Bible says, with all thine heart and with all thy mind. It's amazing that the word for heart, labe, or labe means our will it means the mind so which means when we, we 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 consider where we have been and how god has been chastening us and then we turn away god when he says he turn away with the mind but he also says turn away with all thy soul so there the word is nefesh uh nefesh could mean a lot of things one of them is person or the being Nefesh could also mean vitality, that which gives us life, uh, which we call the soul. You know, when people say uh, your soul, uh, the vitality, um, that which empowers life, the, the vitality is the power. It is the energy that is in us, which obviously dwells in the nervous system. That powers through the entire being. 
it is that which makes the lungs to beat uh, their heart to beat makes the blood to be able to flow it is the vitality obviously our vitality all of us who live upon the earth is limited uh, our behavior and our, our our character and our works they may deplete the vitality faster for some or they may prolong it for others if people live in obedience you see this for example in the life of people like abraham who were very obedient to god abraham lived up to 175 years his son isaac lived up to 108 years and you see people like solomon very disobedient lived a very few years he died when he was just um, you know 58 years old 58 59 so vitality you can you can you can literally die you can literally prolong your life with your habits so obviously habits when the bible says in ecclesiastes for example chapter 7 do not be righteous over much and do not also be wicked over much why should you die before your time you know so people can literally so 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 the, when we talk about people can literally shorten or prolong their lives so the vitality here is what is being referred to uh, that is that makes up the person so the bible is literally saying if you turn away uh if you turn if you return with your mind with all of your mind and with your life you know uh seventh day adventists understand clearly that the soul refers to the live to the entire being uh it says you know god uh, made formed men of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul or a living being so true repentance here involves turning away not only in the mind but also in the life meaning that it is the responsibility of the one who is turning to god to actually go and destroy that which is displeasing to god whether it is the wanks and and the things that we might be seeing and the things we do the company we have anything that evidently displaces god we are to turn away from it not only in the mind but also in the life um and you notice that in the very process of doing that, for example, going to stop a certain friendship that may be leading, it takes a, a changed mindset to do that. And that is exactly what the prophet is talking about. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. New spirit here is not the Holy Spirit. The new spirit here is the new mind, the new thinking, the new thinking notice in the book of isaiah 55 and verse 7 it says let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the lord so notice in as much as divine power brings conversion of soul there is a duty assigned to anyone who received the truth here to say let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the lord and you will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Meaning that without forsaking our evil ways, there is no pardoning grace that can be given. There is no transforming grace. Because if the thinking is exactly the same, if the, 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 the disposition to remain connected with the world is exactly the same, there cannot be transformation in the life unless there is a surrender. And when the Bible talks about the wicked forsaking his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, obviously if I forsake my way and I forsake my thought, I am taking upon me the ways and the thoughts of God. And we observed earlier that the ways of God are holiness and his thoughts are thoughts of truth and righteousness. So there is actually a change. There is actually a new mindset. There is actually a transformation. That happens when a man, when a woman makes a decision to go to God. So when, when Isaiah is writing in the book of Isaiah chapter 1 and verse, um, in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 16, and he's saying, wash you uh, and make you clean. He is actually this, this case is particularly that of David. You remember when you read Isaiah chapter 51, I mean, sorry, Psalms 51, after David had sinned in the matter of Bathsheba. He makes a very fantastic prayer in verse 10. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. It's actually interesting 
it's actually interesting that in Isaiah chapter 50, David prays that God wash him. Yeah, notice he actually says, um, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Um, notice in Isaiah chapter 51 and verse, um, I was reading, in, sorry, in Psalms, I don't know why I'm saying Isaiah, Psalms 51, notice in verses 1, David says the following words, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And then the next text, verse 2, he says, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. So what exactly was Isaiah calling the people of God to do when he says, Wash you and make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Isaiah was calling the people of God to acknowledge their sins to forsake their sins and break off all the works of unrighteousness and return unto the Lord, who alone has power to bring conversion of life. Who alone has power to bring conversion of life. So I wanted to observe here, genuine repentance, here, genuine repentance is not only mental con con consent, but it is a transformation of life. In other words, the whole tenor, the whole organization of the life changes. Anything and everything that is clear that God does not approve for one who is seeking a relationship with God is cast away. I wanted to read this text in the book of um, 1 Kings chapter 8. Chapter 8 is the prayer of Solomon. And the whole tenor of the prayer is about repentance. I wanted to notice how Solomon speaks about genuine repentance here. He says, If they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they are carried captives, and repent and make supplications unto thee in the land of them that carried them captive, saying, We have sinned and have done perversely, we have committed wickedness. Notice from this text here, before a person can repent, number one, there is there is a think, there is a consideration. And Isaiah here has been calling people, my people do not consider. There is a consideration, you know, of, of the manner of living, the manner of life. Why are we in this particular circumstance? And when there is that thinking, then the next thing is repentance. Yeah, repentance. And notice that this repentance is is. is is, is also con contains acknowledgement of sin and confession. Yeah. We have sinned and have done perversely. We have committed wickedness. Acknowledgement of one sin. You know, not even casting blame, but humbling oneself, acknowledging sin before God and repenting and returning to God. And then he says, and so return unto them with all their heart and with all their soul. We, also, we see the exact same text as well as we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 2. And so return, that is repent, return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of... Notice here, they are doing this repentance while they are still in the same conditions of captivity. And says, in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee towards this land which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. So genuine repentance that God is calling us to hear is not actually mental assent, but it is an acknowledgement of sin. It is a breaking down in the life of that which dishonors God. And it is a turning away from that which separates from God. And it is a confession of the sin and a surrender to God. 
and I want you to observe. I'm gonna go back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. I want you to observe when you do these things exactly what God does for us. It says in verse 6, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. Notice the one who is doing the circumcision here. The Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. I want you to observe here. Loving God with all the heart and with all the life is not accomplished by the power of man, but it is accomplished by divine power. But the precondition for God to do that is genuine repentance, acknowledgement of one's sin, confession, and a complete turning away from that sin. I want to read a New Testament text that uses this same exact concept so that you notice that here. Uh, and then we come back to Isaiah. The text that I want to read is in the book of Colossians. Notice in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11, it uses the exact same uh, terminology we found in most of the texts that we are reading now. In 2 verse 11, it says, I'm just going to read from verse 10. Speaking about Jesus, it says, And you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. We are complete in Jesus. Notice verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands. Uh, that is not without men sin, that is divine power. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So notice that this is divine power that is doing the work. That brings one into complete harmony with God. But the precondition of that is genuine repentance, surrender to God. I'm going to read a couple of other texts here to just make this point very clear. Notice here in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which you have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which is shared on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, in First Corinthians chapter 6, when we read from verses 9, he talks about how people were murderers, fornicators, and all these other things. And then in verse 11, he goes on to say, And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the Spirit of our Lord. And I want you to observe here, when you go back to the book of Isaiah, you actually see these exact same uh, uh, aspects of truth being communicated. Notice complete justification and sanctification here in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as no snow. That is complete forgiveness and complete cleansing and first corinthians 6 verse 11 saying you are washed you are sanctified you are justified complete forgiveness god says no matter how dark the sins are they shall be white as snow. in other words there is going to be complete uh, forgiveness for those who come to god in genuine repentance what is the nature of that genuine repentance? So when, when Isaiah is calling people to say, wash you and make you clean, the Jews understood it clearly. Actually, the basis of this thought is based on what the priests would do before they enter the most holy place. You would observe that in the love of water, the priests would have to bathe with clean water and then they are able to enter and minister in the holy place. So Isaiah uses the exact same, um, uses the exact same to say, to talk about the consecration, the repentance, the telling to God that is needed for those who want to place their faith in the path of holiness. To say that you need to repent, you need to confess and acknowledge your sin, you need to put away anything that separates from God, and then God himself will circumcise, in other words, you will bring conversion to the heart and cause you to love him with all the heart and with all the mind. You see, brethren, to walk in the path of holiness requires complete surrender to God. And this complete surrender is not something complex. 
it is us acknowledging our sins and separating from our sins you know how excruciating it is to destroy those movies that displease god because the bible gives us the things that we're supposed it says whatsoever it says what finally brethren whatsoever is honest whatsoever is pure uh whatsoever there is virtue it says think upon these things which means you read that text in philippians chapter 4 verse 8 anything that doesn't mean that standard should not be in the life of a christian um so when, when, when the call comes we definitely need to destroy and to accept and 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 put in our lives only that which brings righteousness but to destroy those things which might even bring bring uh before us much comfort much happiness is not an easy task but according to the scriptures that is necessary and that is necessary to make that decision and to follow through that decision with action it's a very difficult task but in the very process of executing it it brings it brings much transformation of mind it brings much transformation of character so in the book of isaiah chapter 1 from the very onset god is calling us to genuine repentance we might be as the israelites you know our sins are open our iniquities are great god is promising though your sins be as dark as scarlet be as red as scarlet they shall be as white as snow god is promising complete justification on the basis of complete repentance and turning away from sin to focusing uh and returning with all the heart and with all the mind to god to place our feet in the path of holiness you see brethren god is calling us to holiness and god does not lessen his standards um does not lessen his standards because till now we we want to have one foot in the world and one foot in the path of holiness whenever there is any aspect of our lives that is still in the world our feet are not placed in the path of holiness and god is calling us to place our feet firmly in the path of holiness may god bless the reading of his word and guide us as we study this wonderful book of isaiah be blessed in jesus name amen